Welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. This week we welcome Dr. Cameron Webb, Senior Policy Advisor for Equity on the White House COVID Response Team on the Biden administration's quest to address health disparities and inequity. Now, here are your hosts, Mark Maselli and Margaret Flinter. Our guest is a dynamic physician and public health leader whose service in the White House extended from the Obama to the Trump administration. Now, after a run for political office, he's a key part of the Biden administration's effort to ensure equity in fighting this pandemic. Dr. Cameron Webb is the Senior Policy Advisor for COVID Equity on the White House COVID-19 Response Team. In this very important role, Dr. Webb is helping to shape the national discourse and the management of the pandemic. Well, Dr. Webb, welcome to Conversations on Healthcare, and, and, and thank you and congratulations. You've been serving patients all during the pandemic, uh, and we really honor uh, our frontline providers. Uh, and uh, you're just uh, starting to get a good understanding of your role on the team. And I wonder if you could uh, help us define how you in the administration see equity uh, as different from equality. Absolutely. Well, first, thanks so much for having me today. It's, it's great to have this opportunity to dialogue. And, and I think you know, the, the question that you're hitting on was, was actually my first question. When I was deciding uh, you know, when and if to join the administration, I asked, well, what do you mean by COVID-19 equity. I think it's really important to, to make that distinction because in this pandemic, we, we've seen first and foremost that there's no one size fits all solution. There's no single intervention that's gonna serve all communities the same way. So by equity, how we've defined it on our team is, is simply that it's our goal of ensuring that all communities at all times have the resources that they need to not just survive, but thrive through this pandemic. And, and I think it, it piggybacks off of existing definitions about equity. It's just that notion that we have to make sure that we're delivering to communities the tools, resources, and opportunities that they need to navigate the unique circumstances that are driving the direction, the impact uh, of the pandemic uh, on them and on their families and their communities. So I think that's what the work has looked like. And you can imagine uh, that becomes you know pretty pretty large. It allows us to take a pretty big vantage point on the pandemic. Well, Dr. Webb, the recent study found that Native Americans, Latinos, and Black people were two to three times more likely than whites to die of COVID-19 when the pandemic first hit. And actually, I think we started seeing that information almost as soon as the pandemic uh, took off, and it never let up. But we're in uh, another phase uh, of the pandemic. Uh, we still have a long ways to go. We have some treatments available. What more can all of us do to close this gap now in the COVID pandemic, and, and hopefully it will give us some lessons for the future as well, but what can we do to close the gap now? Well, you know, I appreciate that you raised some of those stats early on, and, and at the time I was, you know, both running for Congress, but also I was in the midst of helping serve in my community. I'm an internal medicine doctor, so working on the COVID unit, working to take care of patients, and, and the reality is we actually didn't have all those data. We knew that in I remember it was in, uh, in Milwaukee, 70% of the deaths were in the black community. In Louisiana, they saw similar high numbers. And the question became, how, how widespread is this dynamic? And the first thing we had to ask for was data. And, and months later, in January of 2021, when I joined the Biden-Harris administration, uh, the data that we had on the vaccination effort, you, across the country, only 52% of vaccinations administered uh, did we have race and ethnicity data. Again, just one out of one out of every two, we would only have one of them where we knew the race and ethnicity. Now, in the most recent weeks, we're up to about 80 percent, you know, and overall we're at nearly 75 percent. And the way that we did that was by emphasizing the data. And so I raised that because, you know, in medicine, we say all the time, you can't treat what you can't see. It's really hard to know uh, where the inequities lie. If we're not collecting data that allow us to, to know that and to, to drive the differences. Um, but, but I hit on it uh, a second ago. Vaccinations have been an absolute, uh, you know, huge and game-changing intervention in communities of color in changing that trajectory of the differential mortality. What vaccines have done is they've really reduced those that rate of mortality, and, and it's helped to to level the playing field, if you will. Because while we can't change all those upstream factors that put people at increased risk for severe outcomes, what we can do is make sure that they have immunologic protection to prevent some of those worse outcomes. When you complement that. With some of the therapeutic options like monoclonal antibodies and oral antivirals, what we're able to do is really put together the pieces downstream to prevent folks from dying disproportionately 
but that does not absolve us of the need to continue to work upstream, to terraform communities, to make it easier for communities that have historically been hard hit and higher risk to navigate this and future pandemic. Well, I really love the idea that uh, data is driving uh, the sort of policy making and just thinking about the historical groups that we need to keep an eye on. Uh, this year's theme for Black History Month is Black Health and Wellness. And the theme focuses on how the American healthcare system has often underserved the Black African American community. Why is it important for everyone to understand this? It's important because it informs the very nature of what we mean when we say healthcare in certain communities, and particularly in the Black community. Again, you know, we can go back to what was called the slave health deficit, you know, the mm -hmm. dynamic between folks who came over in the Atlantic slave trade and, and ultimately uh, were, were here into forced servitude. Those individuals, the idea of appearing sick became a real risk to their life. And so that was a huge challenge. You move forward and we continue to see that W.E.B. Du Bois, the Philadelphia Negro. This is the late 1800s. Uh -huh. And there is a chapter on social determinants of health and on health inequities. You know, Martin Luther King said of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. In 1985, uh, Secretary of HHS Margaret Heckler commissioned this uh, task force on black and minority health that found that, that there were these huge differences, these gaps. And health outcomes, that's the first time federally we recognize that. And you can keep going to unequal treatment in the early 2000s. You know, this has been a legacy. We've told this story over and over again. Right. But the fact of the matter is we haven't changed it. We haven't changed uh, those dr dramatic dynamics that lead to increased morbidity and mortality in communities of color. The way that we do it is we have to, again, get far upstream of it. There are, you know, health doesn't happen in hospitals in clinics. It happens in the places where we're born, grow, live, learn, eat, play, and pray. And so if you intervene there, you're giving communities a chance to stay healthy. And then you can put the healthcare system, uh, you can kind of align incentives in terms of quality, access, and cost to make it easier for folks to navigate there. But it takes both. It takes interventions in healthcare, and it takes the interventions in the social determinants. And then I think we can continue to have those conversations, that truth and reconciliation, that reality of the harm that's been done to Black communities through the healthcare system. That's not a remote history for a lot of people. You know, even in my own hospital at the University of Virginia, it's one generation back that, that people were born in a basement in the West Complex building. And so their parents remember that. There are people who say, I would rather die at home than go to that hospital because of what happened to my grandmother. Mm -hmm. So that's what we have to contend with in America. When we talk about race, when we talk about health care, it's not something that's easily done. It takes work and we have to be equal to that task. Mm -hmm. Well, let's uh, talk about an issue that looms large, uh, and that is mental health and the need for mental health support. We know even before the pandemic, our minority populations were less likely uh, to receive mental health support, maybe for some of the reasons that you're describing, less likely to pursue it. Uh, and, and certainly the pandemic has only aggravated and accentuated those needs. Tell us a little bit about how this factors into the discussions and the, the thoughts and planning of the administration as you work to reach uh, all Americans uh, and, and benefit them uh, during this pandemic, but to specifically address the mental health issues. Yeah, it's, it's critical. I think it's, it's impossible to divorce the, the health impacts, the economic impacts and the mental health impacts of this pandemic, and particularly the, the burden that's placed on communities of color. And so I think that from our perspective, a lot of that work uh, we are able to execute through, through SAMHSA, which has done really tremendous work in terms of grant making for mental health services and supports for folks with, uh, facing issues with substance abuse. Uh, all of these are, are challenges that we've seen exacerbated by the pandemic. So by making resources available for community level organizations and entities. That's really where those interventions are gonna be most effective. I think that's one of the keys. But the other thing is just kind of what you're raising. We have to continue to name that problem. We have to continue to, to kind of sound that alarm of the disproportionate harm. And, and nowhere is that more you know, salient, more critical than among our youngest folks. There's a crisis uh, of suicidality in young teens of color. There's a crisis of, of you know, just the, the tremendous mental health impact of this pandemic because of increased orphanhood, uh, folks who've lost caregivers. When you think about the cases and the deaths in the Black community, we're talking about young people who are losing the trusted adults who've taken care of them throughout their lives. And that's going to 
resonate throughout their lives. We have to make sure that we're there to support and engage. So I think it's really taking a, a truly holistic approach to what this uh, pandemic is doing. We've got great leadership at SAMHSA uh, with Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman. And I think taking that mentality yeah. toward the whole person is going to be the key. Yeah, it, it really is. You know, you've got a lot of jobs, uh, including you're still on the faculty at the University of Virginia and your school has recently rolled back requirements for students to get vaccinated based on an opinion from the state attorney general. And I, I guess uh, other teachers and faculty uh, would really look to someone like yourself of uh, what do you do in this type of situation? Uh, are there additional precautions uh, that you're going to take uh, or recommend to people who find themselves in situations like that? Well, I think, I think you're hitting on a really critical moment that we're in, there's a lot of, I, I'll say, eagerness to see the pandemic end. Often mm -hmm. I hear people talk about transitioning from pandemic to endemic. I think there's a misunderstanding of what endemic means. And for a lot of people, they just see those first three letters and they think it's kind of a mashup of end pandemic. And, and <laughs> the truth of the matter is that's not what, what it means. What, what we're seeing is there's this rush to roll back a lot of the strategies that have gotten us to a point where we're seeing less death from COVID-19. So there, there are people who just assume that we got here uh, by accident or by good fortune. We got here because of a vaccination effort. We got here because of layered uh -huh. mitigation strategies, because of masks, because of testing, and, and because of vaccination. So because of all of that, I think it's a matter of taking a step back and ensuring that the decision makers at the school level know, uh, and the decision makers at an individual level, the, those students themselves know that your best way to protect yourself based on the science, based on the evidence, is this. And even though this pandemic has been politicized to a point that it's, it's indistinguishable from the rest of our political rhetoric, mm -hmm. you need to protect yourself, your family, and your community at all costs. And you do that by following science, not by following you know, political rhetoric, oftentimes meant to motivate a voter base. And so I think that's where we, we have to really double down. I think the university as a public institution, you know, the, there's, there's some unique dynamics to navigate. And, and I think that, um, that we're going to do that. But one thing I do love about about the University of Virginia is that there's a, an emphasis on taking care of those students. And so I know that we'll continue to find ways to do just that. Right. Well, I uh, think about where we are at this moment in time, and I think we can say that we have all been treated to a two year intense graduate course in learning about COVID, learning how to respond to it, uh, learning from all the different domains. And we started with the elderly and you know came down to kind of the adults and then the teenagers, the younger kids, and now we're getting very close to FDA approval of the vaccine for kids under five. Hopefully everything we've learned will help us to ensure equity in vaccination, outreach, and delivery. What are your thoughts about the steps that we're taking nationally or the administration as you discuss these issues to make sure we really just knock this one out of the park in terms of reaching the very young children when it's available? Yeah, you know, it's funny because as an internist, I I often focus on adults, right? But and I, I recognize there's a joke that we internists often think that children are little adults, but that's not the case. And, and we know that here with these youngest kids under the age of five, this is a very different vaccination paradigm. So there are some great lessons to learn, but you remember in the earliest days of the vaccination effort, mass vaccination sites were, were critical for throughput to get as many people vaccinated as soon as possible. And that really uh, created access for a lot of communities. There's no such thing as mass vaccination sites for, for three and four year old. If you've ever taken a three or four year old to get a shot, you know, you don't want them out in public. And so, you know, I think what we have to do is we have to change our focus at each step. We have to anticipate what the challenges are going to be. But, but what I do say, and so one thing that's encouraging about this is that for that population under five, this is the population in this country who's the most familiar with getting shots, even though, again, they do it kicking and screaming, and some adults do too. This is, a, this is a demographic where they're used to getting shots. They know where they go to get all their other vaccinations, especially those who are heading into school. And so our job, our responsibility is piggybacking off of that established network. Think about the Vaccines for Children's program, what that's done for equity in vaccination efforts across the board uh, by race and ethnicity over the last 30 years. We say we've got a model here that we have to piggyback on, but some of the most salient lessons we have learned are about how to build vaccine confidence, the kind of questions people have on the front end, and how to not undermine that confidence with the rollout itself. And part of how you do that is we say we're following the science. That means the FDA leads on 
That means we don't tell parents, go get your kid vaccinated if they're, they're three, four years old before FDA tells us that that's what they should do, before CDC tells us that's what they should do, because we don't want that to appear like a rubber stamp. We want people to know we're going to be nimble. We're going to follow what they direct us to do. But politics isn't going to drive whether or not there are shots authorized for kids under five. It's going to be science. And we're going to be ready to, to implement no matter what. That's a starting point. I think there's good news that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines have been fully vaccinated or fully approved by the FDA for adults. I think that's given a little bit more confidence. And I think some of it is level setting. You know, we're not going to expect 90% of parents of kids under five to get vaccinated on day one. We know it's going to take a series of conversations, Medicaid reimbursing providers to have those conversations. That's a big deal. We didn't have that in place before the 5 to 11 rollout. So we've learned along the way how to make sure that those pieces are in place, that we can leverage schools, that we can leverage community settings, we can leverage providers uh, to, to be those trusted messengers locally. But ultimately, I think we put all those things into place and then we just continue to stay at it because it's a matter of, of really keeping that message in front of people. You know, I really like that you laid out a roadmap for parents that it's not just going to uh, snap of the fingers and have your child immunized, that the FDA, the CDCs looked at this. They want to make sure it's safe for children. And that's that's so important. In our own experience, uh, we ran uh, Connecticut's only four mass vaccination sites and, and vaccinated a half a million uh, Connecticut residents. But we know it's a different strategy, right, for these younger children. So there's a lot to to think about. You know, I, I was struck by uh, in one of your earlier answers. You were talking about uh, the need. You know, people are thinking about how do I protect my family? And I, I really want to go into the issue of undocumented adults and children uh, who aren't legally present in the United States. It's just an enormous challenge for them. And it's a challenge for the entire Uni United States health system, right? Just tell, tell our listeners how they fit into the administration's equity focus. Uh, it, it's such an important part of it. So I'll, I'll start off by saying when we rolled out the adult vaccination effort, we heard really quickly that even having mass vaccination sites wasn't going to be an effective way to reach folks because of the chilling effect of the previous four years uh, of undocumented individuals accessing federal services. That concern that this could be that type of interaction they could lead to their displacement from home and from family. And so we had to send a strong signal. We worked with DHS, with FEMA. We really worked with, with ICE. We said there's gonna be no ICE enforcement at any of these spaces. We need to make that really clear. And that's something that really helped. And after a couple of months of that effort, we saw the, the uptake really jump up. I think that what, what's critical is you can't design with them as an afterthought, uh, with undocumented individuals as an afterthought especially with a disease like this, where every single human body in this country is a part of the equation, you have to make it as easy as possible for people to access. And you do that by designing it with folks in mind. And so I think that's what we've learned along the way. I, I think I'm, I'm always reminded from a policy perspective that for so many of these individuals, they're only undocumented because of harmful policies in past years that have kept them in that state, that have made it impossible for them to have a pathway to citizenship. And that's something the president has talked a lot about. How do we change that? How do we reverse that? How do we create opportunity? So, so some of it is just a matter of political circumstance. And, and then no matter what, I think our value of human life is to make sure that everybody has access to the tools and resources they uh -huh. need to survive. And so I think that's it, it, it begins with centering that community. It begins with centering all communities that have historically been marginalized or forgotten about and designing from that perspective. People who have access, who have privilege, who have power, they're going to get access to the resources no matter what. We tailor too many interventions toward that population. I think it's about tailoring and designing interventions to, to folks who have historically and contemporaneously have those barriers, those challenges with access, that's where we need to focus. Well, along those lines, I wonder if I could ask you to comment as well, if there's any thoughts or planning around best strategies to reach our rural populations. Uh, that's a group that has suffered some adverse uh, health impact as well. And certainly uh, people often think of uh, our minority populations as living in our urban areas, but certainly they're in our rural areas as well. Is there anything targeted or uh, thoughtful in terms of innovation about reaching our rural population at this yeah. point? 
You know, and I'm I'm from a rural county in Virginia. My wife's from a rural county in Virginia. She said she grew up with three stoplights, one blinking light. So I mean, we <laughs> we get it, right? And we know what rural means. I think the way that I the way that I think about this is that in rural communities, you have several overlapping dynamics. Here, we know there's a dynamic of politicization of the pandemic, but we also know that rural hospitals and rural healthcare settings have been decimated in the last twenty years. Just in terms, so the the lack of access that we've seen in rural communities far outstrips that that we have in some other parts of the country. So it's a matter of making sure that we're showing up in those spaces with those tools, with mobile resources, um, but also direct, directly connecting with those providers. Because what we know from rural communities is that those local trusted messengers, the public health and the healthcare professionals, the folks who took care of you your whole life, took care of your mama, took care of your daddy, those are the folks who are going to be critical to your making a decision on what you're going to do with your health, whether it's vaccinations, or whether it's about wearing masks in public spaces, how you protect your health and well-being, you know, yes, you're hearing a lot of messaging from various spaces, but if you're hearing from your doctor how to take care of your, yourself from the nurse practitioner who you trust or from the other public health professionals, it makes a huge difference. And, you know, we've also talked about how we can partner effectively in rural spaces. We're, we're always dreaming up this great partnership with Dollar General because that we, we know that there are great opportunities in spaces like that. It's about meeting people where they are, making sure that messaging is, is spot on. And at the end of the day, making sure you center rural health because so much of our country is rural. And, and America, I think, is so much driven by the rural experience. And we have to make sure that um, what we often see is this big spike in urban spaces first, and then we say, oh, the, you know, we're out of the woods, things are getting better. And that's when it's hitting rural communities the hardest. So we've actually developed a cadence where we really focus in on rural communities earlier on. And we've seen from an equity standpoint, you look at Alabama, you look at Mississippi, in some instances, we have higher vaccination rates in communities of color in rural spaces than we have in, in the white community. There are a lot of reasons for that, but I think it speaks to the, the effectiveness of that outreach. Well, from a rural county in Virginia to the White House, uh, helping to advise the president, the president's about to give a State of the Union address. But what can we expect to hear from him about the portfolio you focus in on? And, and I think the, the, the $64 million question or whatever is, do you, do you think there's going to be additional funding uh, for health equity issues? Well, you know, when, when, uh, one of the things that really uh, endeared this position to me was the idea that President Biden was saying equity has to be at the center of our response. Vice President Harris was saying equity has to be at the center of our response. And if you look, you know, day one of the administration over a year ago, there was an executive order on racial equity. Day two, there was an executive order on ensuring equity in the pandemic response. That became a consistent and ongoing theme was how do we make sure that, that equity is at the center of our work as an administration? Mm -hmm. And so I think the president's going to continue to drive that home. I know every time you know we engage, every time we brief and talk with the president, which is regularly, his questions about equity are coming from a place of authenticity. And I think his, his expectation is that we deliver on that. Understanding the historical dynamics, understanding the challenge that exists, that we use the full resources of the federal government to deliver on equity. And I think that's something that, that uh, this is really encouraging to me uh, as somebody who's been an advocate in this space for a long time. I think the president's gonna to continue to drive that message home. I think he's going to, to name the successes that we've had, but he's also gonna name the work that we still need to do. And when it comes to funding, you know, again, a lot of that question goes back to Congress. A lot of that question goes back to our legislative spaces and they're gonna to continue to invest in this space because in a crisis, oftentimes people pay attention. But as we think about next phases, future states, are we gonna to continue to invest in equity and in the dynamics that drive equity? And the hope is that they will. I think the hope is that we learn this lesson from this pandemic, that we are all tied in a mutual, you know, single garment of destiny. And that is what's, uh, what's critical to our nation's success. Dr. Webb, we want to thank you for all that you have done, for all that you are doing, and for sharing your insights with us today. And thanks to our audience for joining this important talk. And remember, you can learn more about conversations on healthcare and sign up to make sure you get notification of our shows at www.chcradio.com. Dr. Webb, thank you so much again. Thanks for having me. I'll yeah, care. that's great. Great to finally meet you. Uh, you're sort of a rock star uh, and, uh, and we're looking for so many uh, more opportunities for you in your future. And we, we hope to stay in touch with you. Thanks so much. You take care.